If you watched the live stream, you would know that I'm filling in for Megan today, because apparently her throat is like a smoker's lung for some reason. But here's your story. Hope you enjoy. Spring is when I prefer to crawl out of hibernation. I prefer it to starving to death, at least, since I'd much rather stay holed up in my study all year. I like nothing more than to keep reading the tombs that line the walls of my tower until my eyes would melt like candles and I would have to learn how to read by smell. But men, even geniuses beyond the kin of common men, need to eat. And to eat, I need gold. And unless everything has changed since the last time I left my study, it takes work and luck to get gold. My preferred method of operation is to make as much gold as quickly as possible, which is typically through some risky endeavor involving a group of assorted specialists seeking some item or villain or kidnap something or other. The specifics rarely matter. At this stage of my life, I've grown well past the notion of asking the why of mundane matters, since they always follow the simple and constant pattern of a logic. I believe it's best to be as direct as possible about indirect things. And I should say this clearly, I'm not fond of logic. Logic may be the greatest triumph of the rational mind, but upon stepping beyond those boundaries, it is a useless tether that inhibits nearly everything I try to do. Logic is the nagging mother who pulls you down to the ground when you try to fly. The miserable teacher who denies your answer since it's not the same as the one in his book. As a wizard, I dedicate myself to the strict principle of completely snubbing logic. I found myself in a tavern, though I'm rather certain that it's not where I was trying to go. The calibration of my teleportation crystal must have either been misaligned or they simply were not in the mood, and I jotted down a quick note to either realign them or scold them when I returned to my tower. Though it was not my intended destination, it turned out to be a suitable place to find an odd assortment of mixed company who are seeking some ancient secret or recent rumor or whatever it is that those kinds of groups are currently concerned with. The path that magic lays out for me is strange indeed, since in only a few seconds, I noticed just such a group huddled in the darkest corner of the tavern, and with a sudden blast of hindsight, quickly scratched out a rather unnecessary addition to my notebook. A blonde haired human man, wearing silver inlaid armor, was lazily arguing with the black bearded dwarf with eyebrows so thick and long they completely obscured his eyes. Across from them sat an auburn haired elf with a bored expression who was slowly tracing circles upon a map with her finger, and all of them seemed to share the aura of people waiting for something to happen. Digging into one of my pockets, I found my Kiyu stone, a large amethyst cut in the shape of a spindle. It remained motionless, and so did I, until the volume of the two men's argument rose sharply and the gemstone began to vibrate. I say we don't need one, the dwarf suddenly bellowed. They are ill luck, and I could never stand their antics. We don't have a choice, the human said, equally loud but far more calmly. We don't stand a chance without a wiz wizard, I asked, stepping towards them, making sure my pointed hat and robes were excessively visible. I couldn't help but overhear, I bet you could, the dwarf began, could, yes, but I ended up overhearing anyways, I continued, and I just happened to be looking for work befitting my profession. The three of them eyed me over for a few seconds, and while they did I had a sudden epiphany. With my skills and incredible intelligence, it made little sense for me to be risking my life following a group of strangers into some unknown dangerous locale all for the sake of treasure that might not even be there. I could simply summon an earth elemental, ask it to deliver me some gold, and it would locate a natural vein of the material and dig it up all by itself in no time at all. Just as I was about to turn away to begin my profitable new venture, the human spoke up. It's good that you offered your help, for we are in great need of a wizard. You see, a thousand years ago, I would have cut him short at that point, 
but politeness demanded that I listen to the full story of all of his ancestors and why it's his destiny to get something or other. While the man recounted the last several hundred years to a person who likely wrote the book he was reciting from, I took the moment to take a close examination of the three of them. The human was clearly a warrior, judging by his build and a sense of awareness. Though his unmarred equipment and light attitude led me to believe he lacked actual combat experience and instead relied on sparring results to satisfy his ego. He had the good sort of pride, the kind that kept you on the straight and narrow path and made you bathe often, though you can't have the good kind without the bad kind. He seemed completely convinced that he was the only one who could retrieve the ancient lost thing and I could only hope he wouldn't get himself needlessly killed. It took me a moment, but the way his nostrils twitched slightly, in a very peculiar way whenever he took a deep breath, convinced me that his name was Lataeus the Allure. It takes a special kind of genius to be able to learn a person's name from such subtle cues. But you can't become a wizard if you can't handle such simple deductions. The dwarf was a dwarf. Stubborn, enjoys ale, and devotedly attached to his beard. While this may seem like something that just about any man who knows anything about dwarves could discern from a casual glance at one, that's actually a rather bigoted idea and you should be a little ashamed for thinking that. I assure you that I noticed many fine details that permitted me to be certain that he was a stereotypical dwarf such as the ale tinker in his hand and the beard on his face. Of course, thanks to my thorough academic instruction, I could read the dwarven runes that he had chiseled onto his armor and discerned his name was Maidine Ironhall. The elf was attractive, but the distinct calluses on her fingers led me to believe that she was well practiced in picking locks and pockets, or she enjoyed tickling armadillos under their chins, which would develop similar calluses. Either way, she was not a woman I would easily trust, but thankfully my drink arrived halfway through the human's tale, and it became that much easier. By watching at what parts of Lataeus' story her ears perked up to, I realized that she was his childhood friend, and that both of them harbored hidden feelings for each other. Likely, by the end of this adventure, they will have shared a few romantic scenes and realized that they had loved each other since the moment they had first met. Unfortunately, that means that I would have to come up with excuses to leave the two of them alone for lengths of time, which meant I would have to drag the dwarf off and spend time with him. Hopefully the dwarf enjoys being regaled by lengthy, historically rich, while highly relevant stories, as I would be sure to provide him with these. Nice of you to drop by, Mr. Pratchett. I'm sick of your lengthy, historically rich, while highly relevant story. Medine interrupted, just as Lataeus was in the middle of explaining how his evil half-brother had stolen some artifact that prevented some ancient evil from doing something. Yeah, we should go out and do something already, the elf added. There was a moment where everyone simply stared at each other silently, until my key stone began to vibrate. Yes, we should definitely go now, as there's no time to waste, I said, moving towards the door. Where exactly should we go? Lataeus asked and he sounded genuinely curious. Well, if your half-brother is clearly evil, then he'll likely be in a clearly evil place. There's a place called Castration Mountain not too far from here, and that's likely the most evil-sounding place for miles. If he's anything like me, he'll stay far away from a place called Castration Mountain, Medine growled. And while I agreed that it wasn't a place any sane man would want to venture towards, I had to figure out some way to convince him to go. It's a misnomer, I said simply. Its name originally came from the old goblin word for Castertion, which means wide mountain. The name changed over the centuries until it became known as Castration Mountain. Ah, she, Medine muttered. But that's still no reason to think that his brother, half-brother, Lataeus interjected, would go anywhere near the place. It's a foolish errand to go there without some short of proof he's there beyond your shilly lane of reasoning. Jesus. I saw he was there through my crystal ball, I invented quickly. So we might as well be going. It took us nearly three days to reach Castration Mountain, and during the trip I spent a good portion of my time explaining the deep mysteries of magic to Medine, while Lataeus and the elf would keep doing that 
glance at each other, then quickly look away while blushing act. It wasn't until we reached the mountain itself that Madine explained to me that he had a remarkable talent. That of being able to sleep while walking. Something that I hadn't noticed before thanks to his obscenely bushy eyebrows. The elf, I swear I'll figure out her name eventually, managed to spy a group of goblins from a good distance away. And my compatriots eagerly ready themselves for a battle. Though I'd rather not dampen their spirits so early in our quest, I was also not in the mood for any of them to discover what the goblins of Castration Mountain did to any men they managed to capture. With a few quick words, I created the illusion of a large boulder, telling them that we could simply hide inside of it until the goblins passed. The dwarf and elf grumbled at the notion of hiding from goblins, but Lateus seemed to think it was a generally good idea. And if they do discover us, he added, we'll just leap out and kill them all. Hiding inside of the illusion of the boulder, we watched as a group of goblins swelled in size as it came nearer and nearer, until we were all rather glad we had chosen to hide. There must have been hundreds of them, along with hobgoblins, ogres, and trolls, all of them well armed and moving with purpose. There are frightening things in this world, but few of them compare to a small army of monsters heading towards you, chatting in loud voices about how they're going to castrate any man they found. I thought you shed it was a mishnomer. Madine dared to whisper as a goblin less than ten paces from us began to cackle as it sharpened its knives. I lied. Castertion actually means to remove the testes in goblin. You bastard. I thought the rest of the group was rather unhappy about being at an incredibly high risk of being found and subsequently slaughtered. I was rather pleased because there was no way these creatures managed to organize themselves in such a large group without some sort of incredibly powerful person acting as their leader. By listening to the goblins and other monsters chatter away, I quickly discovered that not only were they being led by Latais' half-brother, an obvious conclusion, but that if there was an elf hiding from them at that exact moment, her name would likely be Belandra Greenleaf. After nearly half an hour, the army of monsters passed us without even going near our illusionary boulder, much to the relief of my party. Belandra seemed to be ready to go, but both Lateus and Medine required a few minutes to regain their composure. Though they were both hardy men, there's only so many times a man could listen to an army of monsters threaten to geld them before they break down. That number is 637, and they each heard that threat well over a thousand times. With the army out of our way, we made our way towards the massive keep where Latteus' half-brother was holding the... something. In truth, I'm pretty sure I could just summon an earth elemental, have him infiltrate the castle by tunneling through the walls, steal the something, and return it within a matter of minutes. But it was fairly obvious that we'd all have to go into the castle, fight a number of battles against groups of monsters that were appropriately sized for us to triumph over them, and then we finally meet the half-brother, listen to his speech, and after a thrilling battle where the dwarf would sacrifice his life, we succeed in retrieving the whatever it is. Though I felt pretty sorry for Madine, I'm not the person who decided to be completely expendable. Once inside the castle, Belander began sneaking about, picking various locks and opening various chests and drawers. We followed immediately after her, armor clanking as the two other men strode through the stone corridors, wondering what she possibly thought could have been hidden in a pantry. There were a few battles, but I didn't even need to participate in them, allowing me to write up the first draft of Medine's eulogy as the three of them fought. Every so often I would create the illusion of flames and send them towards a goblin just to pretend I was being productive, in case there later was a dispute as to how much gold I was supposed to get at the end of the adventure. After a few hours, we had cleared the outer area of the keep, with the dwarf and elf grabbing anything valuable that wasn't bolted down, but still hadn't figured out on how to get us into the inner part of the castle. Thankfully, just as the party was about to lose hope, my cue stone began to vibrate when I was next to a very large expanse of wall. Unsure what it meant at first, I simply paused, dramatically pulled out my handbook and began drawing various scribbles to stall for time. What is it? Lateus asked, looking excited. There is a strange flow of energy. I'm trying to analyze where it's coming from, I replied, as I drew a picture of a cute rabbit. Wait a moment. This part of the wall seems different, Belandra said, as she began to examine it. Yes, it's a secret passageway. 
After pushing and pulling several stones a few times, she managed to figure out how to open the passageway. As the stones slid to either side, Lateus turned towards Medine and said, See, I told you it was a good idea to bring a wizard with us. We might have never have found this secret passage without him. Hmm, <laughs> was all that Medine replied as he stepped into the dark passageway. I would have noticed it eventually. After fighting our way through the inner keep, we finally reached the massive chamber where Lateus' half-brother was using this sort of potato-looking object in some kind of ritual. Though I was pretty tired from having to pretend to be productive for so long, I listened as the half-brother began his speech with, A thousand years ago, my ancestors began blah blah blah. Somewhere around halfway through his speech, I realized that his entire motivation for performing the ritual was because one of his ancestors was cruelly betrayed by his king, and now he sought revenge against the entire kingdom. While it was true that his ancestor had been betrayed, I suddenly realized a way for us to completely skip the tragic battle in which Madine would heroically sacrifice himself. You're wrong, I simply said to him. King Andalaros could not have betrayed Nadarian Daelor in the Battle of Nargafandalesh, because the two of them lived nearly a hundred years apart, and Nandarin Daelor hadn't even been born when the battle began. Lateus and his half-brother stared at me, but I simply put my hand into one of the large pockets within my robe, and as I pulled out my notebook, I cast a minor illusion upon it. I even have proof. The chronicler... Barga Densha La Buba Duba <sighs> has all the dates right here in his history of the kingdom. In fact, it says that Nadarian Daelor lived a very long time and was good friends with all of the kings that reigned during his happy life. The half brother couldn't believe it and even continued to deny it after he had read the passages I pointed out to him in my glamoured book. So I put my notebook back into my pockets, cast another quick illusion, and brought up another book that told the same story. After four times, the half-brother no longer knew what to believe. Finally, he simply broke down, crying about how he had wasted his whole life believing in a story that had been completely untrue. With tears in his eyes, he thanked me for stopping him from doing something that he would have greatly regretted, and then embraced Lateus like a brother, swearing never to do anything so foolish ever again. What a crummy ending, Medine grumbled, kicking at the ground, looking rather disappointed. Just as we were about to leave, my Kiyu stone began to vibrate once again, except it had never vibrated so hard before. My brain quickly tried to figure out what it meant, but without any real idea as to what it could mean, I simply said the first thing that came to my head. I don't think it's over, I said, turning around to face the center of the chamber where Belandra stood, holding the potato-like thingamabob. You fools, it is I who will summon the Dark Lord to destroy the kingdom, she shouted, holding the frumpy object above her head. Really? I asked. Sighing, I guess I should have expected something like this, because it's usually what happens whenever I narrate my own thoughts and spoil the ending to my adventures prematurely. These kind of unlikely twists tend to crop up whenever I do that, but at least it wasn't going to be too much of a setback. To summarize what happened afterwards, she summoned the Dark Lord. We fought it. Lateus professed his love for Belandra. Madine ended up surviving because Lateus' half brother ended up sacrificing himself to save us all, and Belandra surprised everyone by dealing the killing blow against the Dark Lord. It was all very exciting. Afterwards, we headed back towards the city, only to run into several bands of goblins, since everyone was terribly wounded from the last exciting battle, except for me, because I had stayed back in the back during the fight, but I had a few quick illusions cast on myself to make it look like I had suffered grievous wounds, just so they wouldn't think I hadn't taken my share of the beating. We simply hid inside my boulder illusions each time. We made it back to the tavern, where everything had started, and Lateus thought that would be a good time to propose to Belandra. It was, in fact, a terrible time, because I wanted to get back to my study, but we still hadn't discussed exactly how much I was going to be paid. 
While I was waiting for everyone to finish celebrating, but dying clapped me on the shoulder, his beard covered in beer foam and grinning like only a drunk dwarf can. Seeing an opportunity, I decided to discuss my pay with him, and after some quick negotiating, I had a quarter of the castle's treasure safely stored inside the pockets of my robe, though the dwarf also offered one of his daughters for a wife, which I had to decline on the account of the irrefutable logic that all of his daughters likely had brows just as bushy as his. Then. Just before I was about to leave, I realized that something I was missing. I waited, and waited, until my cue stone finally began to vibrate. Lateus was just finishing retelling the story of our adventure to the Pack Tavern, and his eyes were tearing up as he described his half-brother's noble sacrifice. Quickly whipping out my notebook, I turned to the page where I had written the speech in case Medina had died. After a few quick edits, I committed the whole thing to memory and stepped forward, a tankard in my hand. When I finished delivering my eulogy, the tavern was filled with weeping men and women. Touched by a speech I had mostly plagiarized and filled with generic stock phrases, Lateus thanked me for the kind words for his half-brother, while Belandra and Medine shook my hand in turn. The vibrations from my pocket began again, and I knew it was time to go. With a quick nod, a smile, and a small spin, I teleported away with a flash of light, and I landed in a swamp, likely miles away from my tower. There is only one other post on this worth narrating. Fucking wizards. Well, hope you all enjoyed the story. If you like the story, and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia, as well as join the Discord, and the Reddit page, and get up all in that deviant memeness that you do so love. Also, be sure to check out Nerdbeardia, the other channel we have where even more stories are posted in one form or another. Just be sure to not take your squad. They tend to get broken around Nerdbeardia.